All right, hi everyone. Um, Conference-driven de conference development is great because you can say that you will hold a presentation about something that you would like to exist and then if they take you, you're kind of forced to implement that. <laughs> <laughs> so this is what happened for me and I will talk to you today about type-safe, high-performance distributed actor systems in Rust. I would introduce myself as a hacker who loves systems that are complex in interesting ways and I think that this has in large parts to do with what I grew up with, which were games like A-Train or SimCity 2000, where at a very young age I was interacting with these really complicated systems and through play getting an intuitive feeling for something like that. And what I think needs to happen in general is that we should bring this intuitive systems level thinking to the next generation and I think the best way to do that is through play as well. My brand for doing that is a play, and let me tell you about my first step along this mission. Um, thinking back to these city building games of my childhood, I realized that a lot of my interests intersect there, and it was really the logical thing for me to do to create a city building sandbox where large scale cities with citizen level detail become understandable and designable, and the new thing which I wanted to add is in a collaborative planning fashion. And this is my project, which I've been working on for a couple of years now, called CityBound. Let me give you a short history, and I will go through this really quickly, but just to give you the general background. It all started in 2013, when EA and Maxis together announced the new uh, instance in the genre-defining series of SimCity, SimCity 2013. And what they promised was this, like, beautiful, detailed cities, where you could see every individual car, and they said they would simulate every individual citizen with their lives and you could watch that and interact with that. When they released it, it looked more like this where you have this like city with skyscrapers but restricted to a like two by two kilometer box which is more like the size of a village. And then when you play it for some time you realize that yeah there are individual cars but it's really weird because the people in the morning just go to a random workplace and in the evening return to a different home than where they came from. <laughs> which is kind of not how it works in real life. <laughs> but, but still, this, this promise and this vision of actually simulating a huge city at the individual person level was so fascinating for me that I really, really wanted to try for myself. And this is what started CityBond. I started first by building some traffic simulation prototypes. I used JavaScript and WebGL simply because that was what I was most familiar with and which allowed me to iterate the quickest. And once I had that ready, I just announced that in a blog post together with my like general plans of how I want to do a city building game and a SimCity subreddit and I had what I call the, um, let me see if I can figure this out. Yeah, the announcement weekend because I literally spent a whole weekend just answering comments and questions by other people who were also frustrated by SimCity and who really believed in my vision. I then quickly continued iterating, implementing several very important basic game features and I started to interact more and more closely with my newfound community through blog posts, update videos and even programming live streams. There was, I would say, one defining moment where I invented and implemented a first prototype of what I call planning mode, which really set CityBound apart from other city building games where you don't directly manipulate the city, you just don't build roads over buildings, but you create first a draft a plan of what you want to create, much like in real life, that represents a kind of change set. I think this should be intuitive to us programmers that you want to apply to your city, and that this would be the main way of interacting and playing city bound. But soon after that, I got into a phase where I noticed myself focusing more and more on like hardcore optimization problems and low-level architecture questions in JavaScript. Um, <laughs> And it was quite clear that that wouldn't cut it, so I did the obvious thing and uh, decided to re-implement everything in C++. <laughs> um, it took me quite some time just to get the graphics and fundamentals going again. I did some preparation for geometry, procedural buildings, then decided to focus on these difficult topics like memory layout, persistence, optimization, and realized that if I would continue with C++, I would probably be able to finish within my lifetime, but I would also go insane. So, luckily, at this point in time, 
I heard about Rust and it seemed stable enough to give it a try. So I gave it a try and got really blazingly quickly through the graphics and fundamentals part, thanks to projects like Gleum, for example, which allowed me to immediately focus on the difficult topics like memory layout, found out that, of course, they are inherently difficult, but Rust allowed me to do both really difficult low-level stuff, but then abstract it nicely. So I could move on quickly to re-implement my traffic simulation, and I decided at this point I wanted to have, again, a kind of release to my community, and I decided to radically change how I think about the project and decided to make it open source and to make the first prototype, even though it was just traffic simulation, available to all of my fans. And I also launched a page on Patreon. Since then, I have been, again, reiterating from the beginning all the different game features that are needed, and we will take a look at that later. I want to talk in this presentation about what I feel is the one underlying architectural enabler, um, which is actor systems, which I would call an effective abstraction. And for me, effective abstractions are like arcs. They need very little material, but they allow you to robustly establish a higher ground, which is so robust that you can just stand on top and trust them and even completely forget how everything below works they're so flexible that if you're building like a bridge out of arcs, you don't even feel the changes of landscape below. Continuing with this metaphor. And they're so elegant that they solve many problems at once if you use them. To give you an idea of how I arrived at using actor systems, let me give you my original motivating challenge, which was of course to simulate a whole metropolis in real time on one computer. This implies several challenges. The first one is, if you think about it, it's common in game development that you have millions of particles, for example, but particles are pretty simple things. Like, they're all the same in size, they don't have references to other particles, whereas for me, I have citizens with a workplace and other family members, and they might uh, have different amounts and different kinds of resources, each of them. So, and I needed to batch process millions of them several like 60 times per second at least. So what I needed was to achieve cache locality for something like that, even though they were dynamically sized. Second, because I was pretty much aware that my game state would be several gigabytes in RAM, I didn't want to serialize that onto disk to create a safe game, like that would take forever. Um, so this was my second maybe requirement. And I came up with a pretty well-working solutions for both of these problems already back in C++ times, where I decided to only use plain old data and what I call special recursively compact containers, where you have, for example, a struct of vectors and maybe a dictionary in there, but each of them are laid out uh, consecutively in memory, and if they grow, the whole thing grows and the individual parts get more space. That's a whole topic in itself. If you're interested in it, ask me about it later but I think I kind of get the idea across. The important thing is that now everything in my game state, each entity has a continuous data format that is the same both in RAM and in disk. But there's a problem because these entities cross-reference each other and like they can both be moved in memory and also persisted to disk. And at this point, if you just use pointers as, as references, that stops working, they stop being valid. So the solution for that is, again, something pretty common in game development. I used entity IDs as an indirection and slot maps that resolve the entity IDs into actual pointers at runtime. The last challenge and the toughest one, which I think we're all facing, was parallelization. It was clear that one core wouldn't be enough to simulate it, maybe not even one computer if I'm thinking about really large cities or whole regions. And what is the solution? Well. This is something that we're all thinking about that is a problem to all of us. The traditional approach is that you take many cores or many computers and pretend that they're one. And for that you use shared memory and synchronization that is inherently unsafe and tricky. Rust helps a little bit with that. But um, if you think about the scale that I'm dealing with where you have millions of tiny entities and you want to synchronize them in real time, it just kind of stops being feasible but I heard about this other philosophy where you do the opposite and you say that what if one computer was really like many computers? How do many computers communicate in the internet? They pass messages with each other. Why don't we just take this pattern and scale it down and say that our basic abstraction is a computer which 
I've seen before only in Erlang, but it works really well there and I really enjoyed writing systems that way. And this basic abstraction is not called a tiny computer, but it's actually an actor. It's also known as an object in the original sense, as Alan Kay defined it when he invented object-oriented programming. And the idea is really simple. It's just an object that has isolated state that only it itself can uh, mutate. And it, the only way it can influence other actors' objects is through message passing by sending them messages. So to represent this cycle, let's just take one actor here, which has some actor state, and it receives a message from another actor. It has a message handler that is associated with this particular type of message, and while handling the message, we can mutate the actor state to produce a new actor state, and we can send arbitrary messages to other actors. And out of this, you build everything in an actor system-based architecture. There were even, I think, actor systems for Rust when I started this. There were definitely a lot of solutions for actor systems out there, but I needed something much more lightweight than most of them because they had lots of fancy features. They operated on a really high level, which is cool if you're writing high-level applications like web services or something like that. But I was really okay with something less fancy, like I didn't need to hide asynchronousity or something like that. I just needed raw speed. So I started writing my own actor system, which I called K. And when I started, I realized that, thanks to my previous work, I already had a lot of the basic ingredients that I needed. To represent the actor state and messages, I could use my plain old data plus recursively compact containers. Um, for the actor identity and references between actors, I could, again, just use entity IDs and pointer maps. And the only thing that I was really missing were the message inboxes for the actors where incoming messages are stored. And for that, I just used a simple queue per actor type. Um, in the single core case, in the multi core case, I would just need something like a multi producer single consumer queue, but these are really easy to synchronize and really easy to synchronize in a fast way. And then I looked at which new freedoms does this approach give me. First one is actors don't really care where and how they are stored, which allows you to completely separate your business logic, which is encoded in the actor message handlers from the memory allocation and the layout of the actor state. Furthermore, they don't care where and by whom they are updated, so it doesn't really matter on which core an actor is running and which core decides to process which actor when. So again, you separate your business logic for, from things like multi-core load balancing. Actors also don't care when and how often they are updated. And scheduling is something very important in games where you might have rendering, which runs at a different pace than physics, which runs at a different pace than other things that only need to be updated from time to time. And doing something like this is very natural and easy in actor systems, so again, because the business logic itself doesn't care how often it runs. If you combine some of the previous points uh, that actors don't care when and how often they are updated and where and how they are stored, you realize that it actually becomes possible to stop the whole simulated world, save it to the disk, and resume it at any later point without any serialization. And one extra bonus thing is that actors don't care who exactly they interact with. If they send a message to someone, they don't care about the type of that other actor, they just care that it will understand this message, which allows you to actually create a whole new form of dynamic dispatch from that. And at this point I asked myself, is it possible to write a whole basic game engine with that and build CityBound with that? And the answer is yes, and this will be my first live demo. All right, so let me start up CityBound. Here we are, and I will start by just drawing a plan for a small village. Here we're drawing like a four-lane road. Let's create another second four-lane road, maybe a couple smaller ones to connect everything. And you can see it automatically like figures out pretty complex intersection geometry here. If I wanted, I could have like this horrible <laughs> six-way intersection here and it just works. Okay, let's say I'm happy with that, so I built that. You can see the roads built. You can see it created <laughs> traffic lights for this horrible intersection, which actually have timings that kind of make sense. 
Um, but just like this, it's a little boring and empty, so let's spawn a couple buildings where people can live. All right, that's good. And now if we wait for a second, we will see that some cars appear. And these are actually the inhabitants of these buildings going about their daily business. You can see the cars like break and slow down. They disappear when they reach their destination. They change lanes. And um, if we click on a building, by the way, this is also Imgui, really amazing library. We can see both that the family here has some resources and the individual members of the family have some resources. This person in particular is like getting more and more hungry and more and more sleepy, as I think all of us are. Uh, but they actually solve these problems by driving to these like gray buildings here, which are grocery shops, and the grocery shops sell them food. And everything you see here is actors. Like every piece of road is an actor, uh, every family is an actor, every family actor belongs to this family, every house is an actor. The renderer itself is actually an actor, and all these other objects send messages to render themselves. Um, and I think you can see that I mean, this is just a village, but I'm actually representing every single person with all of their detail. I'm not cheating, they go back to the same home and so on. But of course, the important question for me was, would it actually scale to the scale that I wanted? So let me restart that and um, use a handy uh, generating tool. So let's force the game to create a huge 10 by 10 kilometer grid of roads with eight lane roads, actually. Here you see the plan for that. Let me zoom out. It's pretty big. Uh, let's build that. Uh, this takes a little bit now because this is something that would never really happen in the game itself. Like I would just gradually build the city. But it doesn't really take that long. Now you can see the roads building. Again with the traffic lights and everything. Just here to give you a sense of scale. Um, and now if you look at the frames per second, it slows down a little because right now it's calculating all the pathfinding from every possible spot in this grid to every other possible spot. And yeah, let's just wait for it to settle up. What I will do next is I will spawn 100,000 cars, which should be enough to simulate... <laughs> which... <laughs> which should be enough to simulate a city of about one million people because at rush hour there's roughly 10% of the population on the road at once, according to statistics. <laughs> um, I looked this up, I just don't have the source now. Um, okay, so let's spawn the cars. Again, give it a second for them to appear. I hate such moments. And here they are. <laughs> and you can see now that they appeared. <laughs> Now that they appeared, it still runs buttery smooth. You see every single one of them interacting with each other. Here you can see some changing lanes, the others waiting for them. And again, like numbers like 100,000 are not that really easy to understand, but let me just like look towards the horizon here. <laughs> or zoom out. And I'm not doing anything like that you would expect from games where you only simulate the ones that you see. Like, no, I just <laughs> constantly do all of them. And yeah, you can see these cars now found out what gridlock is. <laughs> <laughs> all right, cool. And they all dynamically, like they have randomly chosen source and destination positions along this grid and they dynamically pathfind their way there. All right, that was the first demo. <laughs> But now let's come back to these freedoms that I mentioned earlier and really think them to their logical conclusion. Actors don't care where and how they are stored, so storing them on a different computer is okay. They don't care where and by whom they are updated, so updating them on a different computer is okay. And 
Since everything is asynchronous and actors don't really care when exactly their messages arrive, sending the messages over network is actually also okay. And at this point, you have to ask yourself, is it actually possible to write a distributed game engine based on that? And again, the answer seems to be yes. <laughs> and this inevitably leads me to the second, much more risky demo. <laughs> Let's get started. I will again launch CityBound. This time you see some IP addresses here. And I will start the same way, first just by drawing a small village. Let's keep it a little simpler this time, just one main road. And two others. Let's build that. Whoops, let me do that again. That was a glitch. Entirely unrelated to all the exciting stuff that I talked about. Okay, let's build that. And now let's lean back and watch what happens if player two enters the game, which is actually Veronica sitting over there, drawing, planning a road on her laptop. She's seeing a real-time synchronized version of my game world. She's seeing one. <laughs> yeah, do it like that, perfect. She built the road in my city, which is running both on this laptop and on her laptop over there. And again, let's give the city some life by spawning a couple buildings. And just as before, we will see these citizens going about their business, only that they don't know that like, some of these buildings might be on her laptop, some on mine. The, the positions of the cars are synced in real time. And it all just works without me really touching the business logic at all, which is the creepy part. And just for fun, let's just stress test this as well. <laughs> I don't know how well it will work because this is just over Wi-Fi. But let's try. So, Veronica, could you please create the grid, a slightly smaller one, just with less lanes, actually? And can you build it, please? And yeah, it took a second for it to arrive, but now this grid was actually kind of streamed from her laptop to mine, including like all the lanes and traffic lights and everything. And uh, yeah, why don't you spawn some cars there? And here the cars are, I'm not doing anything. And we can see them with slight hiccups, but now running just as smoothly as before with the only difference being that they're not only being rendered here on my screen, but that all of their positions and everything is also being live streamed to her laptop. And it should look pretty much exactly the same for her. So here we have this potentially huge city, here just the traffic running in real time synchronization on two laptops. Cool. So thank you very much, Veronica, for being my player too, both in this demo and in real life. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, just to give you an idea of how well all the different parts of the game are already distributed, because even though everything is implemented at, as actors, I'm still used to like the traditional kind of coding where you write everything very centralized. But for example, like I mentioned, the render is really centralized, the traffic simulation and pathfinding are already really well centralized, other stuff I still have to work on. To make it more concrete, this is kind of what happened right now, like there are the two laptops, both of them have a renderer. We each had our individual plan that we were editing. All the roads and the cars on them lived on my machine right here, but they were also rendered on hers, for example. But like the trips, which represent the journeys of the people, could exist to both and like use a car on either of the laptops. Same for the families but there's only one economic market, for example, right now, but you can imagine all of them just cross-communicating to each other, and they really don't know if they're talking to another actor on the same machine or not. To give you just a quick idea in the end about what this looks like in code, I want to show you two iterations of my API design for that. K is something really specialized that I really only write for myself, but I should be even nice to the user who is me, so let me show you what I did there, and we will use the example of a parrot. We will implement a parrot. So let me see. Let's um, start here. We define our parrot. 
we say that it's an actor, it has an ID, and a state, let's just say it has happiness as a number, and it has this compact vector of IDs, which represent the friends of this parrot. Let's invent a message which we could pass to this parrot, a greeting. A greeting has a greeter, which is the other bird, I guess, which sent this greeting, and a number of tweets encoding all of the information in the greeting, as is normal for birds. And then for the parrot to be able to understand the greeting, we implement recipient of greeting for parrot. It has this receive function, which takes the state of the parrot as mutable self, gets a reference to the message, and then it has this third parameter called word, world, which represents the worldview of this actor, the parrot, and is mainly used to send messages. When we receive such a, such a message, we update our happiness by the number of tweets that we received, and we add the greeter to our list of friends. And of course, since we're a parrot, we will just reply with exactly the same. So in our world, we send to the greeting.greeter a greeting ourselves. We put our own ID as the greeter, and we reply with the same number of tweets. Finally, the return value specifies whether after receiving this kind of message, this actor should continue living or dying. And since I don't really see why a parrot should die after being greeted, let's let it live. <laughs> Finally, in the bottom, I have some boilerplate which I need to register the parrot with the actor system and to tell the actor system that it can actually handle the greeting. So there's kind of lots of repetition and verbosity here. And in this example, it's still kind of fine. But if you imagine a whole code base, that gets really annoying really quickly. Something that's really cool is that this ID can refer to any actor of any kind, thanks to this indirection. Something that's not cool is that this means that this can horribly fail at runtime if we send this message to some random ID where we don't know if this actor will actually be able to understand this message. Regarding the ver verbosity, I tried a couple iterations that are really similar to this one. It just got a little shorter, but the main point that I wanted to address was really this problem here. And to invent, version two of the syntax, I had to involve metaprogramming. Not the typical metaprogramming for Rust macros because it really wasn't enough, but the lesser known one, which is build scripts. And what I did was I used the very amazing sin and quote crates, which respectively parse any kind of Rust code or generate any kind of Rust code. And what I did was I basically write this kind of code, which I will explain in a second, this gets parsed and the build script generates additional Rust code that is basically what I, all the annoying stuff that I did by hand in the past. So let's look at this. Again, I defined a parrot. You will notice that it has a parrot ID now. So the first thing the build script does is for each actor type, it automatically generates a corresponding typed actor ID, which can only refer to this kind of actor. Next. I just implement parrot itself and I define a greet function. I don't have to create a struct anymore for the message. I just define a function. Takes again the state. Here's my parameters and the world. This looks the same. And the cool thing is that the build script then generates for the ID type a corresponding sending function. So I can, for example, just say greeter.greet. And this is actually, this is not a parrot object or something. It's just an ID. But what this internally does is send a message to the actor system using this world reference here to some other actor, but it just looks like a normal function call and the code became super short and normal looking. I have to include this additional like auto-generated module, but this makes all of this possible and also includes automatically all the boilerplate for registering all the different messages an actor can handle. So, not so nice is that greeter can now only refer exactly to parrots. But at least we can be sure, and the type system ensures that the ID which we sent this message to, the actor behind that, can actually handle this message. But this wasn't enough for me because I really didn't want to give up on this dynamic dispatch. So I made the build script a little smarter that it can also understand traits. So let's define instead a trait bird here with our greet function, and it takes a bird ID. So the build script now also creates generic typed IDs for actor traits. And um, if, if our actor implements the trait, then it makes sure that our actor ID implements into the trait ID. So now I can pass the ID of the parrot, convert it into a generic bird ID. And at the same time, this greeter is a bird ID and I don't know 
which exact type it will be, but I know for sure that it's an implementer of BERT and it will understand my message. So it could also be a human who implements BERT, for example. Um, and still the type system ensures that this will actually work. And I have dynamic dispatch, success. So now we have type safe distributed message passing in what I would call a dialect of Rust that's still very close to idiomatic Rust. I don't have to create any kind of structures for message. I just write structs for my actors. I can have traits and I have functions to handle messages. I want to, in the end, tell you a couple lessons learned, maybe from the most uh, specific to the most generic. Um, using three different languages, I had different feelings about them, and being a programmer, I will present my feelings to you as a matrix of Unicode symbols. Uh, look at this information density. I will not go through it in detail. I think you can understand this one pretty well. And here are different aspects of the programming languages. <laughs> and I want to highlight one in particular which is really important for me, prototyping speed or iteration speed, where of course nothing beats a dynamic language and Rust compiler is still kind of slow, but it's getting better, so let's give it a poker face. Uh, yeah. In general, consider actor systems as a solution to your problem. If it's distributed or parallel in any kind, it can be surprisingly clean, no matter if you use a high-level actor system with lots of fancy stuff or like a low-level, really fast one. Consider metaprogramming and domain-specific languages or if you want something less extreme, domain-specific dialects. And something that I really had to learn working on a big code base like this is that you should think about coding not just in space but in time. Don't just think like you realize, oh, this is a really ugly architecture and then you invent like your ideal vision, but always keep in mind the steps in between and be ready to take compromises like, okay, I will write part of my code in the new architecture, but if the new architecture is completely backwards compatible to the old one, I can just slowly, gradually do this until everything is in the new style and then remove all the superfluous stuff which I don't need anymore. I did this a couple times in city bound. The borrow checker and type system are your best friends when it comes to this because they both let you see into the future and make you keep the promises which your past self made. Uh, by that I mean like for example seeing into the future you can just change one core essential part of your project and it will immediately through errors show you everything that will be affected which gives you a really good first idea. And of course if you start drafting a new system just with types and then start implementing it Oral checker and type system will be there to make sure that you actually follow your plan. In general, build cool stuff. This is such an amazing community. And if you like the cool stuff which I'm building, check out Citybound open source on GitHub. Maybe not today, but tomorrow, because then I can actually update the documentation to what I quickly implemented the last days. Uh, look at cityboundsim.com, check out the awesome community in Reddit, and if you like city building games at all, Shameless plug, consider becoming a patron. Thank you all very much for your attention.